Thanks for joining. So this is a, a particularly unique problem that we see as foot and ankle surgeons. Our available options tend to be suboptimal and to a large part as well, uh, the research into this is relatively suboptimal. And to that end, I'm hoping to present to you kind of a, a lay of the land on what this is and how we can address this or you know, how I take care of this myself. And hopefully this becomes applicable to you and your practices and helps you when you uh, encounter this. So from an ankle arthritis standpoint, well, we tend to think about this as we might a knee, but in fact, in the ankle, arthritis is different. The knee is highly susceptible to primary osteoarthritis, uh, but in the ankle, that really only counts for about 9% of this. So it's a relatively small fraction, whereas most of this is post-traumatic in the, uh, the foot and ankle, you know, just shy of 80%. That's a pretty high number um, in the foot and ankle. In fact, if we look at some of the prevalences of this, we can see that about 50% of ankle sprains will result in a chondral injury. Nearly three quarters of ankle fractures will. This is why when I'm asked, do I scope my ankle fractures? And my answer is 100% yes, because I want to be able to document what the problem is and stage treatment, or at least so that I have evidence for what I may be dealing with in the future. Something as simple as instability, patients with torn ligaments or just that chronic ankle instability, you know, one in five of them are going to have a chondral injury. And, you know, nearly, uh, you know, more, almost a, third, a little over a third of patients with impingement syndrome will have that. You can see on that MRI, large impingement, anterior, posterior. That itself can be an indicator. When you see these clinically, you, you ought to at least consider the prevalence of, of uh of an osteochondral lesion. Now, really just the basics on cartilage. I don't want this to turn into a basic science histology class, but just to give us some context here is that if we look at the constitutive components of articular cartilage, the chondrocytes really only amount to about two to 4% of that cartilage by volume. Uh, most of the, the rest of it is actually water in the, in the, uh, the extracellular matrix made up of collagen, glycos, aminoglycans, and proteoglycans. So these all make up those components. That becomes relevant when we consider the nature of the problem and how we might address that. If we hope to approximate near normal tissue, we need to take into account that our treatment will in fact reproduce this native cartilage appearance. Without that, I think we handicap ourselves and our patients. Now, what are the differences between the knee and the ankle? And the reason I say that is that the ankle has a relatively small amount of research compared to the knee, but there are some very distinct differences and we have to take those into account when we consider how we're going to treat this. The, the cartilage in the knee can be up to six millimeters thick, but in the, the ankle, it's really only a little over a millimeter and a half thick at its thickest. The, the kind of the directional differences are that the ankle cartilage is thinner, it's denser and less permeable than the knee. And those, all, all those factors really, no doubt, complicate what is already a difficult situation. So we have to be aware of how that impacts our treatment. And it certainly has impacts on uh, some of the treatments we might consider, such as an osteochondral graft from the knee to the ankle, is that there are very distinct histological and anatomical differences between those two sites. And you might find limitations in your therapy if we rely on tissue that's not similar enough. Now, where do these lesions occur? And I think that if you're familiar with this field, we've all been educated on Bernd Hardy's original classification. Um, and it certainly helped us to understand some of the biomechanisms of this. But more recent research has uh, discovered that these lesions really aren't anterior lateral and posterior medial as we were taught in school. But in fact, these tend to be medial and lateral on the central aspect of the Taylor Dome. In fact, on that left hand, uh, dorsal picture of a Taylor dome, you can see that 53% of these in Raken's study were on that medial Taylor shoulder and a quarter of them on the lateral Taylor shoulder, whereas there was a relative dearth on the anterior medial and posterior uh, or anterior lateral and posterior medial portion. So what that implicates is uh, a difficult time in getting to these lesions. If they are central, uh, we may be relegated to osteotomies or um, some type of plafondoplasty or other techniques to try and get to these. It really does complicate that. And that work has been validated by other authors, Elias in 2007 or in 2012 as well, validated this. Now, why the Taylor Dome? Why not more the tibial surface? And I think that any of us in this field have, have operated on these understand that there's a high prevalence on that 
articular surface there. So if you think about this, that's not necessarily unique to the ankle. Other convex surfaces appear to be predisposed to this. If you think about it, Taylor Dome, as we were mentioning here, first metatarsal head, medial femoral condyle, lateral capitellum of the elbow, femoral head, humeral head. There are all these convex surfaces seem to have a predilection towards injury. Uh, and some of the data in the ankle may help us to understand that. And that's because the data that looks at the relative strength and histological characteristics of those convex surfaces in the ankle shows us that the Taylor side of that joint is less robust. And that would be a possible explanation for why this tends to be more, uh, uh, more susceptible to injury than, say, the tibial surface. Okay, so let's just think about this. If you were to I, create an ideal solution, I think this is a great place to start, is if you said, all right, what's the ideal solution for an articular injury? One, obviously we want it to be safe. We don't want unsafe uh, treatments in, in our realm here. Second, I, I argue that simplicity is an absolute imperative, imperative when it comes to treating things surgically. We're already dealing with a complex problem. And when you take a complex problem and layer a complex solution onto it, I think you compound your probability for suboptimal outcomes. So simplicity for me becomes a real critical factor in decision making. And you'd also like this to be reproducible. You don't want to see it that it works in one and doesn't in another. Uh, for an articular injury, you want to optimize the biology of the articular surface. You don't want to just simply optimize or near normalize the anatomy, but you want this thing to biologically behave like normal tissue as much as possible. And then uh, as far as the constitutive components of the osteochondral unit, we would like to preserve what's normal and then restore what's not. And that would be keeping in mind that cartilage subchondral bone plate and cancellous bone all play a the subchondral bone really for that cancellous bone they all play an important role and although they are connected they each individually ought to be considered and avoid damaging one if when if and when possible i think we can be much more nuanced than being you know brute force surgeons to go in there and just simply do something because we can and it makes us feel good i think we need to be much more nuanced and scientific in our approach and then we would like to see sustainable long-term results. Admittedly, in this entire field, this is one of the weaknesses because our data doesn't show either one it's sustainable or we don't have good long-term results with this. So there's one of the inherent weaknesses with um, articular surgery. And then cost-effective. This is the sticking point for most of us in this field is that these, these procedures that are more complex than say bone marrow stimulation tend to be uh, expensive. Uh, but if you take into account the, the cost of repeat surgeries or subsequent surgeries and even subsequent care, I think you can make an argument that these, in fact, in some instances are cost effective because we can avoid the need for a subsequent surgery. So therein lies some of the, uh, the dangers of relying just on simple upfront cost in these, uh, in these cases. So when I look at this, there's really four factors that need to be resolved. Stability must be resolved. Data is very clear. If you don't fix the stability problems with these ankles, in other words, if they have a lateral ankle instability, your, op, your uh, outcomes will be suboptimal. You really ought to address those. The anatomy ought to be normalized to the best degree possible. Alignment, obviously, if you have varus valgus alignment in the ankle or even the hind foot, you need to address that as it could severely hamper your results. And then the biology is the real key here. And this is where I think our efforts can be optimized at this point is we're beginning to have biological options available to us to enhance our healing. Now, to, not to get off track, but to really kind of paint a picture of how articular injuries relate to other problems we deal with and how we can learn from those other problems. Let me give you an example here. Um, you know, skin, skin lesion. So here's a, a wound dehiscence on a patient. Um, if we think about skin tissue, I think it's fairly close to what we deal with articular wise, but we would really have four basic options when it comes to treating that wound. We could cover it with an scar or scar tissue and it would make us feel good, covers it up, wounds closed, doors closed, but is it really ideal? And I think most of us can argue no. We can do some kind of a whole tissue transfer, that is native or non-native tissues that we can put into there. So it's grafts, it's a rotation flap, it's something to that nature to cover that up. We can enhance the local wound environment through biologics or some kind of a biological graft. Uh, 
or we could combine these things. And if we think about uh, a Taylor dome injury in the same vein, I think it begins to change how we think about it. So let's compare skin on the right, cartilage on the left. The cartilage is actually composed of several layers. There's a, 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 a very organized histological appearance to cartilage. It's not just simply a bunch of chondrocytes and a bunch of extracellular matrix. There are layers that perform different functions. So that superficial or tangential layer, for example, is very good at shear uh, protection. In other words, it it's really where the cartilage shear tolerance comes from. But if you go deep down into those radial layers, um, you know, that's 30 to 40 percent of this tissue, and it's really great at compression. And then we have a tide mark, and we have this subchondral bone, which are really a lot like uh, this, the dermal layer, this, the basement membrane layer in skin. So really, if we look at this, we can learn some lessons from how we treat wounds and how we could apply that to treating chondral injuries. So really, I would make a, a supposition that, that chondral layers, a lot like the ep epidermis, that uh, what we call tide mark in cartilage is a lot like the basement membrane. It's what's anchoring that car cartilage to the bone. And then you have dermis and subcutaneous fascia, all very analogous to, uh, to um, skin. So let's look at this in terms of options here. We won't have to spend a lot of time, but I want to present this so you understand where options are for you to treat this. And we can break them down into numerous categories. I've broken them down to these three, which works for me. Marrow stimulation, which really is the microfracture, uh, what's sometimes referred to as augmented microfracture. That is microfracture with a kind of a graft to help stabilize the clot, abrasion chondroplasty. You can use large osteochondral grafts, allografts, or a kind of newer techniques to use grafts from the patient, or lift drill fill fixates, a kind of a one that's been recently mentioned, and in which case you lift the cartilage and graft underneath it. And they're all viable. They have the application. Cell-based therapies are different from osteochondral grafts in that even though it is a graft, you're relying on the biological activity of the graft to give you the effect you're looking for. Let's just go through each of these real quick and talk about the pros and the cons because that'll help you to make your decision on what you're going to do. So bone marrow stimulation, what are the pros? Well, it's simple, and it's really amenable to arthroscopic approach and cheap, so it's very easy to do. Uh, you can even combine it with some cell-based therapies. And what you get are about 85% good to excellent outcome scores. And I highlight outcome scores because what we're doing is we're measuring outcomes with instruments such as the VAS score or AOFAS score, which to my knowledge are not necessarily clinically validated instruments. So are they applicable? Yeah, absolutely. Are they as good as we could hope for? Uh, probably not. And so we have to be a bit careful in our application of this technique because what we're really creating is an outcome score. And if that's what your goal is, great. But I think we can be more, more nuanced than that as surgeons. The cons for this is it's biomechanically inferior. And so it has limited durability. It will break down at some point. Um, it requires damaging the subchondral bone plate one of those constitutive components to the osteochondral unit. And if it's intact, I would ask, why are you damaging a normal piece of tissue in a very delicate structure? You can get, in some instances, intralesional calcification, but what's the outcomes from these? And this is really where kind of the, the light is being shed on bone marrow stimulation. And I don't knock this because I still use it. I just have become more reticent to use this as I did in the past because the data is showing us over time its limited durability. You know, Hunt in 2003 showed us as early as that, that there were 54% of these that had four, fair to poor outcomes at 66 months. So what's that showing you is that after a period of time, this thing begins to uh, show be uh, worse results. Uh, half of them were still painful. Ferkel in 2008, only 30% of those that he saw had repaired tissue that was um, integrated with the adjacent cartilage. And about a third of them had deteriorated uh, after five years on second look arthroscopy. So this is where the kind of the question comes in. Is that best for your patients? You need to make a decision. Lee substantiated those that uh, uh, these previous authors found. 80% of the ones in his study had visible cracks and fissures. That's, that's a bit of a concern to me. Um, in 2010, 15, 19, further studies looked at this and found either non-homogenous tissue, you know, poor outcomes, Second look arthroscopy on Yang's study in 2019, one of our more recent ones, showed that it, uh, 
uh, at a follow-up of about three and a half years, uh, they had a third of these with poor integration and about a quarter of them, they couldn't match what they found on arthroscopy with the MRI, meaning that this could be a little tough if you're running off an MRI to tell you, did this heal or not? Well, in a quarter of those cases, it's not correlative. Now, here's really kind of the take home from pulmonary stimulation is that you'll see good results. VAS on the left, AOFAS score on the right is that you get good drops in the VAS, but it levels off at around 24 months. And interestingly enough, the, the hind foot ankle scores also level off over 24 months. So yes, you are get good, getting good outcome scores, but are you really restoring the tissue so that it's viable long-term? Again, back to a kind of an ideal solution. It should be sustainable. Osteochondral grafts, and this really, I think we're all familiar with either autograft or allograft. You know, we're going to apply some kind of a graft in here being uh, a, a graft from the knee to the ankle, graft from a cadaver through fresh frozen to the, the ankle, something to that effect to repair that defect. And so the pros are it's one step, it's awesome. Hyaline cartilage, you're getting actual hyaline cartilage. Uh, you are repairing subchondral bone. Um, it's very useful in revision cases. That's probably its best application. So large defects, you really don't have a lot of other good options. It's relatively quick recovery because you're just waiting for bone to heal against bone um, and then waiting for the cartilage to take after that. Allows for immediate range of motion. Um, and so obviously there's some limits in weight bearing. The cons are there's there's limited donor sites in the foot and the ankle. So we're going to be forced to get these from somewhere else. Irregular surface congruity. So back to that slide with the knee and the ankle is that the thickness of the cartilage between the ankle and the um, knee is different. And so you don't always get congruous surfaces. Uh, there is some donor site morbidity, um, and that's for autographs. Now, there is a little bit of debate. Some studies showing donor site morbidity is pretty high and others showing it's not. So that's a little bit of a controversy. And so the jury's still out as to how consistent that happens. Um, incomplete graft incorporation, as we'll show you here in a second, is a real concern. It may require an arthrotomy or an osteotomy, and they can be expensive, more so than these grafts we're going to be talking about today. So to just give you a couple of, of studies on this, El Rashidi in 2011 took 42 ankles. They have a follow-up of a little over three years. They had 73% good to excellent outcome scores. So, hey, pat myself on the back. Patient's feeling good. 18% of these required subsequent arthroscopy, and they found 10% of them had failure of the graft. At uh, uh, 33 months, on 15 of these ankles, they did an MRI. And what the MRI showed was surprisingly, although they had good outcome scores, patients were feeling good, 80% had poor graft incorporation, and 33% were unstable, meaning that although they felt good now, that won't sustain itself. That will fail. Uh, Raken in 2009 and again in 2017 by event and Darren looked at these as well. Uh, the 2017 study is probably our best one because it was a systematic review of five studies and they found that about a quarter of these required a reoperation. So um, that's, a, that's a concern to tell one in four of your patients, I'm gonna have to go back and fix it because this surgery didn't work. And that's a bit of a concern. So let's just look at treatment outcomes. If we look at these across the board, we can see that rest, cast, and excision have relatively poor outcomes. So conservative treatment of symptomatic lesions will fail about half the time. If we look at excision, bone marrow stimulation, now we can start to get 85% give or take good outcome scores. So again, short term, they're going to feel better. Um, excision of the graft and, and curatage of that doesn't always work real well. Anterior grade drilling, which I really don't know many people do, has poor outcomes. Retrograde drilling does pretty well. Grafting uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see does well. Fixating an unstable one can help out. If we compare that with these biological graphs here, you can see that the outcome scores are very similar. So what that gives you is a high level of confidence that we are at least no worse off than other graphs. But histologically, we could be finding better outcomes as the data comes on board over time. Now, I can throw statistics at you all day long. And I think that Mark Twain's comment that there are three kinds of lies is very apropos. Lies, damn lies, and statistics really are, are all types of lies. And so we can manipulate the data in any way we want to tell us the story what it wants. So I would encourage you to become a student of the statistics, but begin to look uh, at the more nuanced approach to this. How do we measure that? Well, we're going to look at levels of evidence. I won't belabor all this point, but we all understand that there are five levels of evidence commonly used. But at last check, and, I, and this was probably about a month ago, or no, probably six months ago, sorry, uh, 
there are more than 80 unique scoring systems for levels of evidence. And that really confounds our understanding of where the data is best placed. But you know, the, the point of an evidence-based medicine is to integrate the best available evidence into practice. But to my understanding, there are only two randomized controlled trials on this whole topic of Taylor OCDs. And in both studies, the combined number of patients was just north of 50. That's not great power in the evidence. So we can ask ourselves is, you know, where does the evidence really lie? Most of it's case series, and that's relatively low. And I, I think it's a very valid point. But I think that asking ourselves, what do high quality studies say about this is a second order question. The reason I think that's the case is the first order question is, is a randomized controlled trial the gold standard in surgery? And I make a very compelling argument that it is not. Now it would be ideal but there are certain confounding variables we can't use. So when we evaluate treatments, whether it's bone marrow stimulation graphs or more biological graphs, we have to take into context some of the limitations in surgery. So if we're looking and waiting for large randomized controlled trials, um, it'll be a while and it may be never. But in randomized controlled trials in surgery, we have some simple limitations. For example, small sample sizes. Uh, the surgical treatment is expensive compared to say a pharmaceutical treatment. How do you do a washout period? You can't. How do you do a crossover in a surgical trial? You can't. There are anatomical and pathology variabilities that exist among patients, even in the same patient. One ankle doesn't always look like the other. How do you do a placebo group? That's unethical. You know, the formula, the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics of drugs are known and they're consistent. In surgery, all of the things we deal with vary. Blinding is impossible. So there's multiple confounding variables. So that really, the first order question is, is, is the randomized control trial the standard by which we should measure treatments? And I could say, ideally, if they exist, use it, but I don't believe it's going to be practical. And that's across the board for most surgical disciplines. So that's not to belabor it, but I think that's an important point because we'll all ask that when somebody presents to the office with, hey, here's a new treatment. I'm gonna ask them, where's your evidence? but I do have to be a bit uh, cautious in expecting high level evidence with surgical studies. So how do you treat this? Well, I would really break it down into this. So diameter across the x-axis, depth down the y-axis, is that if you have a small lesion, the evidence is pretty good that less than 15 millimeters bone marrow stimulation works. Larger lesions, you need to put a graft on it. The bone marrow stimulation will not work. You can augment that with PRP, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, and hyaluronic acid. Of those three, bone marrow aspirate concentrate has the best evidence, um, but they do help to restore this. I don't personally any more microfracture above about 10 millimeters. I'm a bit reticent just because I think the data, although good outcome scores, I'm looking at long-term. I'm playing the long ball here. Now, the rest of this is that as you get below six millimeters, you're gonna have to think about filling in that subchondral bone plate, reconstituting that. Uh, reconstituting the subchondral bone. And so there are a host of options that you can use. Which one's best? Well, that's gonna depend on your comfort level with the procedures, which one works best in your hands and individual variability of the patient. So my advice is pick the one that works best in your hands, but become a student of the game so you can enhance the tools in your toolbox. Here's a couple of case studies we'll go through here before we end and take some questions. So one of them is a medial Taylor shoulder lesion here on arthroscopy. You can see that little flap folded off on that shoulder there. So that is a full thickness flap of uh, an articular defect here. So this one we addressed with a medial malleolar osteotomy. In that middle picture, you can see the free air elevator has elevated that cartilage flap. It is not adhered down. In fact, on the right, you can see out that excised loose section of cartilage. It wasn't even adhered down to the bone. We excised that out. Here's the defect. Um, now, this one could be a problem because it is a shoulder lesion, meaning it's uncontained. But uh, we did a little bit of an abrasion to that subchondral bone surface to rough it up, not full thickness to create bleeding, and then placed the graft. So that right-hand picture, we took Cardamax and placed it into that graft. And it handles like a putty, which is fantastic because it's easy to mold. There's no glue that I have to put down. There's no you know, multiple steps. It's just take it and like aloe matrix, just stick it where the defect is. Here's another example here. We don't have any long-term results on that from an arthroscopy or MRI standpoint, but that patient at three months was asymptomatic, no pain in his ankle. Here's case two. So medial Taylor dome lesion, subchondral cyst. So this one was treated with arthroscopy on initial examination. Here you can see that 
fissuring and lifted cartilage on the medial talar uh, shoulder. Get in there and here's a medial malleolar osteotomy. We see this defect just right at that leading edge of the tibia. Um, this was a full thickness uh, defect. So cartilage, subchondral bone plate, and subchondral bone all was, uh, was damaged. So we curetted that out, creating a defect in there. Take the Cardamax, again, just kind of a very easy to manipulate product. Filled in the defect with bone, just took some calcaneal autograft and packed it in the defect. Applied the Cardamax over the top, fixated the ankle. There's your graft right over the top of that lesion. And the question is, is, what does that look like? So this was this is a patient that's a colleague of mine. He asked for some help on this one. I don't wanted to point this out because this is a quite fascinating outcome. So at two weeks, this patient slipped, slightly displaced his osteotomy. We elected just to watch it and see if it would heal. At nine weeks, it's clear it was becoming a non-union. So last week we went in to repair the non-union of his medial malleolar osteotomy. So he fell hard enough to displace an osteotomy with two large bore screws. And my concern was, did he displace the graft? Well, here's an arthroscopy and we've plantar flexed this ankle as far as we could. And so what you're seeing at the very leading edge of that tibia on the top surface there, and then that Taylor dome on the bottom half of the picture is, that is the defect site. And although this picture is a little on the grainy side, it does not do it justice. There was complete healing of that cartilage at nine weeks. Um, which totally uh, surprised me. I was expecting to see a dislodged graft or incomplete healing, but it's evidence to the power of using biological products to treat a very difficult problem. It becomes the evidence for uh, our ability to think in a more nuanced way about these problems. So the take home from today is, I want you to appreciate both the biology and the anatomy of the osteochondral unit, what I would call a bioanatomical model. Don't just look at the anatomy, think about the biology. Treatment goal is to preserve what's normal and restore what's not. Don't damage something if it's normal. This is already a very um, delicate piece of tissue. Don't damage it if you don't need to. Exercise caution with treatments that are designed to create limited duration outcome scores. You're gonna pat yourself on the back for a couple of years like I did awesome, and then in two years, you're back to square one. So I would caution about using outcome scores as your end point for treatment. And I want you to think scientifically about the problem. Uh, what's going on? What do I need to fix? And then I always consider this. What would you do if this were your ankle? Would you want a large cadaveric graft? Would you want just a simple little cover with a scab? If you think about that large open wound on that foot, would you want to see that tissue repaired, normal skin, or would you rather have a big scab on there? I think I would pick the one that would restore as normal tissue as possible. Thank you, Dr. Williams. That was great. So one of the questions from the audience that we had was, in your opinion, would Cardamax be a viable option for first MTP joint cartilage lesions or prechondral bone involvement versus osteotomy for patients without bunion deformities? And so I would make the, I'm assuming that this is in reference to just true osteochondral lesion in the joint. The, in that joint, um, I think that all of us that treat it understand that there are some other unique biomechanical issues that go on with that joint. For one, uh, we tend to see reduced range of motion in internal compressive forces in the joint. So I would say if you have a joint that has relatively normal joint space and range of motion, yes. I think if you have a reduced range of motion, you see reduced joint spacing, then you need to exercise some caution. Could it be combined with, say, something like, you know, a, a decompression osteotomy? Yeah, I think it could be very reasonable. Um, the, the one caveat is that you've got to consider that the cartilage in the first MP joint is very thin, even more so than the ankle. So you might have to make a little bit of a deeper uh, kind of a defect and then graft over that. Um, I think I have one colleague of mine who's done that in the first MP joint, and I you know, I, I hate to say that I haven't asked him how it's went, how it's gone. I have not personally done one there. Would I be hesitant? No, I wouldn't. If I had, again, normal joint spacing or near normal joint spacing and uh, relatively good range of motion. And I think our last question that we'll end on will be, what is your typical post-op protocol that you're using for these patients? So the post-op protocol is largely predicated on the uh, other procedures I'm doing. And so if it's a medial malleolar osteotomy, they're obviously going to be non-weight bearing until that's healed. If I'm doing um, a lateral ankle stabilization, I've got to take into account what type of a repair I did and its necessity for 
uh, range of motion, non-weight bearing. So in, to a large extent, it's predicated on other factors in most cases. But all things aside, I don't weight bear these people for a minimum of two weeks to allow the graft to go in there. And even at that point, it becomes toe touch and gradual, very slow um, increase in weight bearing and activity. But I do start range of motion um, no later than two weeks out just so that I can get some remodeling or at least some contouring of the graft so it smooths out. Um, but it's like I said, largely dependent on other procedures in most cases.